slide, Tim. I just want to welcome everyone here. Let's uh, see we've got a few visitors anyways, a few people I don't uh, see here regularly anyways, and um, hope you're blessed and edified, built up this morning, and, and I hope you enjoy it. Let's start this morning with, uh, if you want to take your so black song books and turn to song number 195. I know I pick this song fairly often. Um, I, I, I just feel like it's a good song to kind of start worship with. You know, just the, 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 the beginning of the song says, Come, thou found of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. That's why we have a worship service. In the, that we start our, our morning service off with that so that we will begin our time here with worshiping God. And this song is just a good way to get your mind going in that way. It's a prayer asking God, tune my heart. Just like, you know, if we would tune a guitar or something like that, tune it, make it sound, put it in the right place to sing thy grace. You know, it's just, uh, now I don't think we can ever properly actually sing, do justice to singing of the grace of God or, or telling of it even. But, uh, um, but the song is a prayer asking for that. And let's sing it. Number 195. <clears throat> Come thou fount of every blessing Tune my heart to sing thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mountain, fix upon it, mount of thy reach. By thine help I'm come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter, bind my heart and soul to thee. From the never wander, Never leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. In song number 812. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, the great love the dear Savior has shown to shamefully die on the tree, leaving his scepter and beautiful throne to rescue a sinner like me. Number 812. <clears throat> Oh, the great love the dear Savior has shown to shamefully die on the tree, leaving his scepter and beautiful throne to rescue a sinner like me. wonderful love oh such wonderful love Jesus my Savior left scepter and throne to rescue a sinner like me palaces mansions and inns had no for Christ, who so joyfully came. Down from yon heaven our path to illume and save us from sin and from shame. Oh, such wonderful love. Oh, wonderful love. Jesus, my Savior, left scepter and throne to rescue a sinner like me. Man of great sorrows and homeless was he, but yet my Redeemer and friend, pouring in infinite streams upon me, a love that can never more end. Oh, such wonderful love. my Savior left scepter and throne to rescue a sinner like me. Number rejoice that uh, that Christ died for us, that he saved us, um, that we're forgiven, that we can live through this life now having peace with God, um, having assurance, assurance of salvation, assurance that, that, we're, that we're loved, that we, that we have a home that's coming. And that's, uh, you know, that, I mean, it'd be worth it if it, was, if it was, if Christ died for forgiveness alone. But I mean, the fact that when this life is done, no matter what it brings, no matter what we live in this life, we know we have this hope that we have glory. We've got a land that is fairer than day. Like today is a beautiful, sunny day. There's a land coming that's going to make this look like, <laughs> like a dreary, rainy day. You know, that's like when we've got this beautiful, uh, I was going to say spring. It feels like spring weather. Um, but uh, there's, a, there's a day coming. There's a land promised to us that will make this look pretty lousy. That's coming for if you believe. Number 951. <clears throat> There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar. For the Father waits over the way. 
a dwelling place there. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet by and by, we shall that beautiful shore we shall sing on that beautiful shore the melodious songs of the blessed and our spirit shall sorrow no more not a sigh for the blessing of rest in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by we shall that beautiful shore to our bountiful Father above we will offer the tribute of praise for the glorious gift of his love and the Blessings that in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and reading. Verse 6 starts with, a fool's lips enter into contention, which is like an argument. It's uh, an argument derived with anger, and his mouth calls for blows. A fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snare of his soul. The second verse is 29 verse 6. It says, by transgression, an evil man is snared, but the righteous sings and rejoices. And finally, Proverbs 12, verse 13. Would one of you guys want to read that one? Sure. 12, 13. So, yes? Snared. Yeah, snared. And so, does anybody know what a snare looks like? 
What does the snare look like? It's a trap where there's two metal beads like this and then uh, spikes and then you step in the middle of the mm -hmm. It's basically, it's, it's some sort of a contraption that's made to keep you, right? If you cross paths with a snare or a trap, you're not going to get past it. It's designed to grab you and hold you and keep you there until the person who had set up the trap is there to release it, right? It's usually not something like, say for instance, the snare is not really something that you can get out of. And I came to, I wanted to give you guys a bit of an example. So here we have just a simple brass snare. And so set up like this. So there's the hole and it's big enough so something can get through, right? And so I thought instead of bringing a bunny, I would just bring a leaf, right? Because it'd be easier. So who wants to try to put this through the hole? Vincent? So try to do it as carefully as you can not to get the stick stuck in the hole. Oh, you did it, wow. Try it a little bit quicker, see what happens. Oh, you're very fast. You'd be a really good bunny. Let's try that again. Okay, maybe we'll try someone else who <laughs> isn't that good of a bunny. <laughs> uh, there you go, I'll try you. So, let's see if I can just reset it. Now this is, I will confess, this is my first time making a snare. So maybe, that has something to do with it. Okay. Now try to pull really hard to get it out. See what happens? Then you just make a mess, right? You rip it apart, right? It's not actually supposed to go all the way through, right? It's meant to hold you. And so, we'll take that back. I'll take one more volunteer, one more. There you go, you can try. Oh, you made it too, wow. You, a lot of good bunnies in the crowd. <laughs> Thank you. So, but the idea is that when you pull through, it catches you, and then the more you pull, the more it grabs you and it grabs you tighter and tighter so that whoever's going through the trap is not going to be able to get out, right? The way it's supposed to be done is the person who set the trap, which then would be me, releases it and then you can get out, right? And so, now when we read these, ver these verses and we hear that word snare, then we can get a visual in our mind of what it's like, what it's talking about. So whatever the subject is or the topic is, if, it, if it's telling us that it's gonna bring us into a snare, it's gonna capture us, right? It's gonna capture us and it's gonna hold us there, right? Until this trap has released us, right? And so let's try reading these verses again with that picture in mind of what a snare is and what a snare does. So we'll start again with uh, Proverbs 18, verse six and seven. I'll read that one. A fool's lips enter into contention and his mouth calls for blows. A fool's mouth is his destruction and his lips are the snare of his soul. So now we can see what it's doing, right? So if, if, um, if we are a fool and our lips are run by a fool, right? Our lips are the snare, are the capture, are the trap for our soul our soul will get trapped by what we are saying, right? If we are being a fool with our lips. Who wants to read Proverbs 29, verse six? So that actually makes me just think of a scenario, right? 
So an evil man, by transgression, that's by his wrongdoing, right? It says that's how an evil man is snared. <clears throat> but then the opposite of that is the righteous sings and rejoices. So I can kind of picture two men walking down, the, down a path, right? And one is evil, and he's plotting all sorts of evil, and he gets caught, and he trips, and he's stuck in his evil. He can't go any further because it's evil, right? And then I see the opposite of that, someone who's righteous, and they're just, you know, not a care in the world, right? They're just singing and rejoicing, right? So the evil, they get trapped by their sin, right? But the righteous, they get to sing and rejoice, right? And one more, we'll do Proverbs 5.22. Do you want to read that one, Keegan? Five, Proverbs 5.22? Exactly. So his iniquities and trap or his own iniquities and trap of the wicked man is caught in the cords of sin. And that's something that um, <clears throat> sometimes when we get caught in our sin, then we like to look at others or look at other scenarios or situations to see where we got caught. What was the trouble? Where, was, where did that come from? But if we read here, it says our own iniquities. So his own iniquities, the ones that he does himself, is what gets him trapped, right? And so we know the thing, some of the things that, can, that in, can entrap us, right? Our, our own lips and our own actions, our own sin can entrap us, right? And <clears throat> but so I didn't want to just leave you there. I wanted to finish off with Proverbs 14.27. Proverbs 14.27. So this morning we found a lot of, a few different ways that we can get caught, where we can get snared, right? And so we want to know how to also avoid that. So Proverbs 14, 27 says, The fear of the Lord is a foundation of life to turn one away from the snares of death. And so that's how you turn away from the snares, right? That's how you go around them. That's how you can rejoice and sing. When you fear the Lord, you remove yourself from the path of the snares. So you don't have to be so worried and concerned about the snares, right? Because if you look, if you look back, it is always talking about a fool, right? A fool's lips will catch him, his own iniquities, someone who's a fool is performing iniquities, right? And so the opposite of a fool is someone who is wise. And we know that the Bible also says the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord, right? And so Proverbs 14, 27 says it, the fear of the Lord is a fount fountain of life to turn one away from the snares of death. So we want to avoid the snares, we fear the Lord, and he'll help us and he'll guide us. When we can't see, then he can see. And there's something else I wanted to point out about the snare. And you guys can probably see it relatively clear because you guys are pretty close. But if I was to ask anyone from the back if they would be able to see it, it'd be really hard to see it, right? And snares are usually like that, where they're kind of caught in the dark or a little bit on a corner, something where it's not going to be like, oh, here's the trap, right? It's a snare, it's a trap. It's meant to be concealed and secretive, right? And so when you fear the Lord, you don't have to so much worry about the secrets because he will direct you and he will guide you. Because the things that sometimes our own eyes can't see, the Lord sees and the Lord will help you that way. So that's my lesson for today. Thank you so much. Stand up for some singing, please.
Do that one. And we're going to go through it quite slowly because the letters are kind of hard to say. And then we'll go through it again a little bit fast. All right? Everybody ready? I am a C. I am a C. Sorry. 
Good morning. I'm glad the children have so much energy to still do that. It was uh, fun to be young once, right? So appreciate the lesson too, John, just to uh, simple illustration of the snares of, of, uh, of the evil, right? And um, just the book of Proverbs, been reading it quite a bit lately, try to read one chapter a day, just follow it through the month. And so every time you kind of pick up new stuff all the time, right? And it's always a, a good thing to do. So I'd just like to welcome everyone here this morning. Thank you that you come out and see some visitors. So we appreciate you and hope you'll be blessed here today. And uh, so we'll just go over a few announcements before we get started with our main message. So we're planning our Thanksgiving dinner for October 28th. Um, we're just waiting for confirmation from... Um, What's the place called again? Emmanuel Christian School. We tried Lighthouse Gym, but they're all booked up the whole month of October and November, so we have to go Plan B, so hopefully that works out. So we'll kind of keep that date open in your calendars before you book it up. Hopefully we'll have confirmation here next week, and then we can plan for it all the way. So, uh, Just a reminder, and I put an announcement this morning, too, on the announcement page for the uh, Bible donations that we've been doing. Uh, Henry Liz are going with the group to Uganda this coming Thursday, I think. And so if you would like to donate and haven't donated yet, there's a, a box in the lobby where you can put cash in or you can donate online at uh, springfieldmissions at gmail.com. So take opportunity for that as well. And uh, I think the youth did a lot of care packages on Friday and a lot of stuff is getting ready to go. So thank you so much for everyone who's been invested and helped out. So it's a huge, uh, I'm sure they appreciate that very much. So um, other than that, I don't have any other announcements other than uh, the mission board will come up to do a presentation. I think Abe Ham is the spokesperson today for that. And then other than that, Henry Weed will come up and share a main message. So God bless you. Oh, good morning, everyone. Lots of activity happening. It's really good to see um, all the response from everybody and the different things. And, you know, um, this year with the mission board, it was kind of one of those things where we didn't have a projected uh, projects for for the year. And at uh, times we were a bit worried about it. Like, do we do we worry too much about it? But one of the things that was sure in our mind is that we wanted to focus on things at home and not worry so much about other countries and other stuff because we also seen a need in in our own midst in our backyards and so focus on that and some different things that we we're going through right so we just figured you know what we're not going to stress it too much we're not going to stress people too much with projects abroad or, or anything like that and um, just the response and everything you know this uh, um, this Bible donation that uh, was been put together for Henry and Liz that are traveling with another group to Uganda, the response is overwhelming, and it's it's really it's 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 a huge blessing to see that that's just you know born in su such a short time, and and everyone is um, everyone is just active with it in the care packages that the youth put together. I just seen the short end of it, loading it on Friday there, and I didn't even know if that was everything, but just just all of that just just uh, amazing right and kind of uh, get to a point where it reminds you well it doesn't all depend on you uh, <laughs> um, and that's great you know um, I uh, get so into activities and projects and whatever and then sometimes I have to remind myself you know this this isn't about you this this you know you just one aspect of this um, and uh, with with all of that, you know, we we uh, a project was born um, not that long ago where we seen that you know we need we need to do some things at home here, and one of the things was is just uh, uh, an inconvenience was created with uh, different counseling sessions with at the elders' homes where you know they would come home from work they would have to rush to clean up and they would. Um, uh, meet people at their home and, and it just um, disrupted their family life and, and all of that. And uh, so um, this idea was born that we have some rooms downstairs that, uh, that could easily be utilized for that and uh, they needed some work done. And uh, I was reminded the other day that uh, we visited Henry and Liz and, and we were talking about different things and uh, Henry mentioned, you know, um, the, the God things, the, the things that he initiates, that he leads, we don't ever have to worry about them. They'll just come together. They'll just work out. And I've been 
pondering that a lot because this project, we, we put it out there that we we're going to build this counseling room slash office for administration for the church downstairs. And so we put out this little blurb about we need somebody that's in this trade and that trade and the other trade. And the response was just uh, immediate. People were ready and willing. And um, so we officially started the project on July 10th. And it's just been evenings and not even every weekend. And in less than two months, we had it all put together. So um, for some reason, to me, it felt like a lot longer. But the man hours that have gone into it is actually very, very few, very few. And it's because of, uh, it's because of all of you who participated. So first off, uh, th thanks to everyone here. Um, your Sunday morning offering is a part of what goes to the mission. Um, there's a percentage that goes there, so all of you contribute it, even though you didn't know it. Um, and I would suggest that you continue to consider those things. And um, we pitched it at a brother's meeting, and uh, there was a unanimous favor that we uh, go ahead with the project. Um, and like I said, it's twofold. It's a counseling room, meeting room for the, for the leadership, and it's also for uh, uh, all our record keeping for the church. We're moving that all over to this location instead of uh, some people have had certain things at their home and stored it there and, and things like that. So we're making some, some improvements there. Um, and just, you know, if you can picture somebody needing some advice on something and, and having a session with with the leadership that, you know, um, not all conversation is uh, uh, um, appropriate for the dining room table or the living room. There needs to be some privacy. Um, there needs to be some confidence that someone isn't overhearing it. And, uh, you know, that the family, their family, because all of our leadership still has family at home, that doesn't get disrupted. The kids don't have to spend a couple hours downstairs somewhere out of sight and stuff like that, that there's an option for people to meet somewhere. That is the vision, that's the goal of this. And um, yeah, um, like I said, just the response from, from all of you have just been overwhelming. And the, the idea was born there. And then I contacted Marian Penner and she started with design and floor plan and she did a great job. And she, the artwork you see in there is hers. Um, she did that. I'm super grateful for her involvement in that. And um, again, immediate response from everybody else, right? Like John Neuter, he's like, hey, you know, a couple of guys, I'll do the flooring. We'll get that done. And so I remember seeing John Neuter, John Fair, Alex Dyke, Abe Dyke, Philip, and Dave Braun working on the flooring there and got it done on a Saturday morning, I think it was. And, uh, and then... Um, uh, there was a bit of electrical to be done, and Otto was more than willing to, to do that. And um, Benji was uh, involved with coordinating painters, and he did a lot of the drywall work, the patching and stuff like that. Um, Dave and Eva and the boys, they came down installing the doors and the trim. And then Alex with his brothers, they were here a different Saturday morning installing all the, uh, the cabinets and the furniture, and, and super grateful for that. Um, and many different people donated things, uh, electronics and different things. So um, it was just people coming forward and saying, hey, what can I do? How can I participate? And uh, so that's something that we've, we've done locally and we're super excited about it. Um, I was approached at one point, somebody was wondering what in the world's going on? Why, why is that all being torn up downstairs? So. A lot of these decisions, they, they do get, or all of these decisions, they do, do get mentioned at the brothers' meeting. So uh, participate in that. Come on out so that you know how, how things operate and, uh, and what's in the, what's, uh, what projects are, are being done. And that way you can participate as well, however, however um, uh, you see fit or whatever your gifts are, right? So come on out to that because that's where the decisions are made on how the giving is spent. So if you, know, if, if you have concern about how your giving is spent, that's usually where those decisions take place. So I would encourage you to come out. And um, uh, I've, had, I've had the privilege of serving on the mission board for uh, nearly five years now. And um, 
I've been put on another board, the church seen fit that I serve somewhere else. And so this coming meeting, um, there is going to be, uh, there's a number of nominations and there's going to be a vote on replacing my position as chairman and also another position as well. So come on out, put your, put your voice in, um, help the whole corporation function. Uh, you are a part of it. And uh, there are some very capable candidates to fill these shoes, and I'm very grateful that they are there. And again, um, that is still open. If you'd like to nominate someone to serve on the board, on the mission board, um, please contact Willie Penner, send him a message, and nominate whoever you think would um, uh, fit that position well and serve in that position. Um, that's all. Thank you. God bless you. Good morning. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Abe. Um, so let's maybe just start off this morning just by, um, 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 yeah, let's just start in um, um, prayer and just dedicate that space downstairs for, the, for God's ministry and for God's work. So if you guys want to just bow with me in prayer and we'll dedicate that space to, to the Lord. Father, we, we thank you for this morning and Father, we thank you for for that for the space downstairs that, that you've provided. And thank you, Father, for the mission board, for, for Abe and Franz. Thank you that... Um, that you you pressed it upon their heart that they, they, they saw a need that there was a need for a space to, um, to, to to counsel and a space to have all of our files and everything stored properly and father we thank you that you've pressed it upon their heart and that they acted upon that um, we ask that you may just bless them for for that as well um, thank you for that space down there and father we just ask that you may just um, or that, that, that you're that all the uh, counseling sessions that are to be held there and everything that is to be done in that room, that it may be to your honor and your glory. We thank you, Father, for everyone that um, volunteered their time, everyone that um, that contributed to that project down there. We just thank you, Father, for that. We we are blessed to see how it all came together. We just ask that it may be used for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> yes, I've... Yeah, if, for everybody that went down there to take a look at that, I think it looks great. It's been a huge transformation in that room. It's you could, if you had a before and after picture, you could hardly recognize that it was the same room. So it's definitely, definitely looking great. It looks like it's going to be a great space to, to do counseling and to, um, yeah, and it also, also a great space to have all of our all of our files kept. So that's that's great. And thank you guys for looking into that and getting that done for us. Um, yeah. So on on Thursday, um, we're going to be heading off to Uganda. So that's going to be that's going to be exciting. We've uh, it's and, and you know what really this has all come together so fast. Like at, at the beginning of the summer, um, it was Liz's cousin said, "Hey, we're, we're they're thinking about going to Uganda and just wondering if we would also be willing to come as well, along with as well." And we're like, "Well, okay, we're, like what do we what, like? What's in Uganda? What are you guys doing? Like who's coming? Can we come, can our kids come? Like how's this all working out?" And um, and then it was like a lot of this kind of planning. Like, is it going to happen? Is it not? Not sure. Like it's, uh, yeah, we were planning on going and we had the dates so kind of when we were thinking and kind of had it out in the air and then all of a sudden, just like that, it's like, yeah, we're going, we gotta buy the tickets and like, it was a month ago that we bought the tickets and all of a sudden it's just like that, it's here. So there was like this anticipation, it wasn't really, there was this, uh, like this something in the distant, far distant that we're gonna, we're gonna go to Uganda, it's gonna be in September and maybe we won't, maybe we will. I don't know, there's a lot of things up in the air, like, um, are we going to be able to travel then? Or not? I don't know. Like, in, in the there is the whole visa thing. Like, I'm not sure. I, I've heard visa processes take a long time, right? And so far, we hadn't even talked about visa applications. We knew that, yeah, you need to have a visa to go to Uganda, but none of that had been talked about. So I was like, yeah, you know what? Maybe we, I don't. I, I had my doubts that we we're going to go in September. Honestly, <laughs> I did. I thought, you know what? Yeah, we have these uh, these plans, but like, I don't even know what's going on with the visas. Like, I'm not sure. Like Richard Gazuli, he was taking care of all that, and I was like, all right, well. Uh, We'll, uh, we'll, we'll plan for it and kind of have our mindset that, you know, that's when we're planning on going. But I, w I was anticipating delays, honestly. Quite honestly, I was thinking that. But um, you want, when, when, when um, God is in it, things can come together real, real fast. And just the way that everything came together, like Richard went um, after we, we bought our tickets, actually. We bought our tickets a month ago. And then the, a couple days later, Richard went to the embassy to the 
um, Ugandan embassy to go get our, our visas. <laughs> so I was like, all right, we'll see. We got our tickets. Let's just, uh, let's just hope that, because um, we know, I, I know somebody else is trying to get a um, 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 visa to go to Switzerland or no, somewhere in Sweden maybe. And there, it's going to be a two or three month process just to get this visa, right? So I was like, I'm not sure what kind of visa, what, what the process is. And yeah, Richard's going to the embassy to get this visa. And I'm like, all right, we'll see when it comes. He's like, yeah, we got the visas. We're all good to go. It's like, hey, what, what? Like, like you went there and he's like, yeah, it took like a minute. He says, yeah, the lady at the counter says, yeah, because I know you, you know what? I'm going to, like less than a minute. Here you go. Here's your visas. <laughs> we're just like, oh, oh wow. <laughs> well then, well, well, okay, we're going. We're definitely going. We got the tickets. We got the visas. We're on our way. Um, and then the way that these Bibles came together, man, we've been so blessed with everybody's generosity, like, because, yeah, we were thinking that like, we wanted to get, bring these Bibles across, right? Like Richard was saying, he, he hates preaching the Word of God and not being able to sh leave a Bible with him because these people, they, they can't just go and buy 10 Bibles and decide never to use them, right? To them, if, if they have a Bible, it's like, you know, that's something that's, that's a rare commodity. So we wanted to bring these Bibles along. We're like, yeah, we want to bring these Bibles. And um, the Bibles we wanted to bring along, we tried searching everywhere for them, and it seemed like we just weren't going to get them in time. They're just... You know, we, we, we had ordered these Bibles, and it turns out, yeah, they were going to be backordered. Everywhere they were backordered, and we couldn't, just couldn't quite get a hold of them. And all of a sudden, Liz found this place that had them, and they were in stock, and we could have them shipped a couple days later. So we ordered the Bibles, had them shipped, and it's like, yeah, everything is just, just falling in place, just, just in time. God is, <laughs> God is really early, but never late, he, but he's always on time. God is always on time. And so um, Richard, he was planning on going to, on, on, on Fridays when he was planning on going and dropping off these Bibles because yeah, we got so much stuff that we, we were going to take it all in suitcases. We, we figured we've got 17 people going means we can have 34 suitcases, 50 pounds each. We can bring a lot of weight over. All of a sudden we start collecting all the stuff and we're like, oh my, we, we, this is not going to fit in 34 suitcases. <laughs> so Richard's going to, so Richard, he, he's going to ship the Bibles down there beforehand. Um, and then, yeah, so the Bibles, they just, real, they, they just arrived at the shipping depot in the United States. We couldn't ship them to Canada. I go to the shipping depot um, Friday morning. I, I head over to the shipping depot, and they were going to be open at 9 o'clock. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to make plans. I'm going to try to be there at 9, 9.30 at the latest, try to get there, because I'm going to try to get back and get these Bibles to Richard. Well, you know what? On the way, on the way to pick up these Bibles, I'm praying for God's blessing upon the border, just saying, you want to give me a safe ride there, safe ride back. Just ask for his blessing as we pick up the border, go across the border and pick everything up. And just like that, I feel like the Holy Spirit just saying, hey, you forgot your passport. Like, oh, man, I forgot my passport. I need the passport to cross the border. I got to go home. I, it's like wasting all this time. I was hoping to be there. And it's like, like I'm not going to get there in the time I would have thought. You know, I'll, I'll get there at like 1030 at the earliest. It's like things just aren't working out. Well, I get to the depot. I go inside. I'm, um, I'm really way behind schedule what I thought. Get to the depot. I'll go in. I like, get yeah, here's your package. I'm like, hold on. It's like there's supposed to be 25 boxes. It's like, well, this is all we got. We got one box. I'm like, oh man. Like, what's going on? So I go inside. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this phone call to the to the place. Like, hey, like, where's the rest of my Bibles? Like, what's going on? Like, I, I came all the way to destroy or to Port Huron to pick up these Bibles, and they're just, we uh, we don't have all the Bibles here. We got one box. We're supposed to be 25 boxes. And just then. <laughs> I'm dialing the number, 1-800, and the guy comes out. Hey, they just showed up. Like, we, we just, like, give us, like, 15 minutes. We got to put them into the, just process the order and everything up. But, yeah, they just showed up. <laughs> I'm like, wow. Had I, not been, had I been early, I would have been headed back with one box of Bibles. <laughs> but because I forgot my passport, I was there just in time. And I was thinking, like, wow, it's just, just the way everything has worked out. It's just like, man, you know what? This is definitely definitely been God's hand in it, right? And you wouldn't, now, I've said this before, and I'll say it again, you know, sometimes we, we look at situations like this, and we're like, well, it's just coincidence, right? Like, anybody forget their passport, like, anybody, like, I say, no, you know what, like, I, I, do you see God, you recognize God's hand in your work? Do you recognize God hand, God's hand in your life, where things that you could just chalk up as uh, just, just being coincidence, just, you know, just the way it kind of, kind of worked out, or, you recognize that you don't know God's hand. Like if, if you're in the will of God, God is going to orchestrate things to help it work out, right? Like God's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to the, to the knowledge of the truth. So when you're working to help people come to the knowledge of the truth, God's hand will be there. So I've just been 
super blessed and yeah we're just super excited to head over to uganda we're going to be we're going to be going to some prisons um so the ladies are going to be going and sharing the gospel at some um um ladies prisons we're going to be sharing the gospel at some men's prisons the, the children won't be able to go but they're going to be um sharing the gospel at some of these schools and hospitals so it's going to be it's going to be a great time so we'll, we'll be spending two weeks there so we're leaving on on thursday and then coming back two weeks later and it's going to be yeah I'm, I'm definitely excited i've seen um throughout this past few months they've been um sharing with us some of their ministry some of the things that they've been doing out in uganda um some of the revival meetings they've been having and some of sometimes there's like thousands of people that show up like just thousands of people that come up show up to hear the word of god um so yeah it's uh I'm hoping that when we come back, we can bring a report to you guys and kind of show you um, how everything went and hoping to in- inspire more people to think about how can we minister? How can we share the word of God? You know, we, um, Jesus says that w- w- when he left, he said, Jesus says that, 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 that we are to share the gospel first at home, then to your neighboring countries, and then take the, take the word of God to every corner of the world. That's the purpose of the church, to share the gospel, right? That's why God didn't just rapture us out the moment you're saved, because we are left here to share the gospel with the world. So that's, anyways, my introduction this morning. This is uh, yeah, some exciting stuff going on later on this week. <clears throat> Other than that, I'm, I'm going to be continuing on in, in 1 Peter. So I'm, I've been preaching through 1 Peter, and now I'm up to chapter 5. This is the last chapter in 1 Peter. So... I'm going to try to get through this, and we have communion today as well, so that's another exciting thing. We have, you know, the fellowship of the, fellowship of the, chains and, of, of, of the saints, and part of that is taking part in communion, recognizing why are we here. Well, we're here because of Jesus, because of the shed blood of Jesus. So we take part in communion to remember that. It's, it's not about us. It's not about getting together to be in this little, little group. It's about, it's about serving Jesus, right? <clears throat> so chapter 5, in, in, in chapter 5, He's, Peter is addressing the elders. And as I was kind of preparing for this, and as I was reading this, I'm thinking like, man, you know what, like really, there should be somebody else coming up to preach this. There should be, we should have a guest speaker to come and say, hey, you know, let's, let's exhort the elders, because he's addressing the elders here. So now I'm going to tell you what Peter is saying to me. And some of you others. Like, there's not, elders is, it, it also, so elders is, um, it's people that are older. There's, there's people that are older, people that are older in the church, but then there's also the people that are um, the elders, the leaders in the church. So here in chapter, chapter 5, verse 1, he says, the elders who are among you I exhort. So the word exhort, it means to strongly encourage or to urge someone to do something. So he's giving us a, a, a strong urge, a strong encourage, like, come on, guys, let's do this. Let's, like, let's get busy about the kingdom business. Like, what is, what is your purpose? What are you doing here? Are you guys just out to get together to have a, little, have a little group? Or are you out here to preach the gospel and to see people walking in truth, to see people walking in holiness? Are you here to encourage the flock to, to, do, to, to, to follow as Christ, um, as, as, as Christ leads? So he says, to the, to the elders who are among you, I exhort, I, who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. So Peter, he's not just saying, that, hey, this is what I want you guys to do. He says, no, this is what I'm doing. I am also a fellow elder. Peter is a fellow elder. He's also a partaker of the sufferings of Christ. He was a witness of the sufferings of Christ. He saw Jesus being crucified. So he's telling us what he has seen and heard and and experienced. He's saying in a way, as, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, he says, imitate me as I also imitate Christ. So he's strongly urging the, the leaders in the, in the church, the elders, that in the same way that he is serving Christ, be an imitator of him. He also shares with what, what we are experiencing. So what does he exhort us to? He says, shepherd the flock of God, which is among you. So be a leader, be a shepherd. In the same way that a shepherd of, of, a, of, of a flock of sheep, he cares for the sheep. He makes sure that the sheep are not going in an area where they're not supposed to go. He makes sure he leads them to green pastures, leads them to water. 
So it says, shepherd the flock of God. Take care of the congregation. Take care of the people that are entrusted to you. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. So he's telling him, like, you need to shepherd the flock of God who are among you. Remember that you are overseers. Okay, don't, don't do it by compulsion. Don't do it that, you know what, okay, I, I have to do this. I feel like I do it. But no, get that out of your mind. I, I, okay, I, I feel like I have to just do this. But do it willingly. Change your whole mentality, the whole attitude, and do it willingly. I'm telling you, this is something that really has spoken to me in the last little while. We're, like, it was, I think it was, I don't know exactly, but I think it was like almost 10 years ago that I was voted in to be one of the elders of the church. And honestly, this is something that has definitely spoken to me, where it's like, I, I feel like, okay, you know, I was voted in. I, I need to do this because this is, it was more by compulsion. And honestly, this is something that has spoken to me where I, I, I can't be, where I feel like I have to do it because it's just how it turns out. But I have to do this willingly. I have to step into that role willingly. They're saying, serving, I need to serve as an overseer and do that willingly, knowing that I'm not doing it to serve you guys. I'm doing it to serve Christ, and that should be an outflow, and the outflowing of that should be in service to you guys. And don't do it for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Sometimes, quite often, in different groups, and different, um, um, different religious settings, the people that are the overseers, the shepherds, they have a uh, prestigious position, right, where they are looked up to. They, have, they can have a lot of things that they can gain by having that position. I think that's not really the case in our circles as much, not that I see. But he says, don't do it for dishonest gain. Don't do it in a way that you know, you're you going to become profitable by, by being a shepherd of the flock. No, do it, do it eagerly. Do it willingly. Even if you weren't going to get any gain from it at all, do it eagerly. Also in verse 3, he says, nor being lords over those entrusted to you. So don't go and say, no, look at me, I am your leader, therefore you have to follow me. No, don't, don't be a lord over them. But be an example of the flock. Jesus came when he, Jesus came as a servant. And as an elder of the church, we are called to follow Christ and to also be a servant. We are called to be a servant of all, to servant to everyone. Be an example to the flock. So if I want you guys to do something, I can't go and tell you guys, hey, this is what I need you guys to do. But no, I'm called actually to be an example and say, no, as I do, follow me. And, and to be able to say with Paul as well, imitate me just as I imitate Christ. And you don't imitate me as I imitate Christ because you want to follow after me, but I'm hoping that you guys can see Christ in me and recognize that you're not just following me, but you're following Christ. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of glory that does not fade away. You know what? This, throughout the, throughout the um, um, letter that Peter wrote, throughout this epistle, he tells us many times that, you know what, there's going to be times of suffering. There's going to be difficulties. There's going to be things that are going to come up that are not going to be comfortable. But remember why you're doing it. When the chief shepherd appears, when Christ appears, we're going to receive a crown of glory that does not fade away. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, Paul is writing, and he's telling, he, he, he's writing to the church and um, telling them how they ought to treat elders. There's many passages that have a lot to say about elders and leaders in the church. So here in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Let the elders who rule, among, who rule well be counted worthy of double honor especially those who labor in word and in doctrine. So here, he's making a distinction between elders and elders who labor in word and doctrine. He's saying that, you know what, there, there's a bunch of elders, like there's a bunch of leaders in the church, a bunch of people that are leading in their own different ways. We have um, elders, people that are leading in worshiping song, leading us into a heart of worship. We have people that are leading in a lot of the, um, um, a lot of the more business side of, of, of the church. So there's... And then there's me and John who lead in word and doctrine. We have Abe who leads as a deacon. We have other people that also lead in their own different ways. So he's saying that there's, there's a distinction between elders that are, that are leading in word and doctrine and elders that are not leading in word and doctrine. But he says that those that are, that are leading well, those that rule well, count them worthy of double honor. 
in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 1, it says, do not rebuke an older man. So he's talking about just somebody that's older. It says, so younger people, like, don't, don't rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father, a younger man as a brother. So he's saying this is how, this is how people should treat elders. Somebody that's older than you, you don't just go and rebuke somebody older than you. You recognize that, you know what, they're older than you. It means that they have a lot more wisdom than you. But if you see something that they're doing wrong, it doesn't mean you can't come. Just because, just because me and John and Abe are the elders of the church doesn't mean that we are going to be perfect. But no, if you see us doing something wrong, you guys are called to exhort us as a father. Or exhort us as somebody that you recognize we are still in the flesh, we are still human, and we are prone to error. And we have to be willing and to, to, to receive correction from even somebody that's younger than us. <clears throat> and then in uh, verse 19, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, it says, do not receive an accusation against an, against an elder except by two or three witnesses. So he says, like, if somebody has something against an elder, he, he may do something wrong, but there has to be two or three witnesses. You can't just say somebody is going to slander an elder because he doesn't like something that he does. right? There has to be two or three witnesses. If there's two or three people that say, you know what, this is not, I, this, he's doing something that's not correct, that's not right, then you can take that before, before the elders. Or then you can take that before the congregation and have that accusation against an elder. <clears throat> but anyway, early on in the church, the disciples, as uh, the um, yeah, the, the disciples, as they went out preaching the gospel, um, they came back afterwards and they appointed elders in every church. They appointed people that were going to be leading in the church. In Titus chapter one, verses starting at verse five, um, Paul writes here. He says, "For this reason, I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking, and appoint elders in every city, as I commanded you." So here, he's saying Titus, that he, he left him in Crete so he should appoint elders in every, in every city. Have those people that are going to be shepherding the flock, those people that are going to be overseeing the rest of the congregation, who spend time in, in prayer and spend time in like, everything that they're doing should be directed towards how is the church flourishing? How are we serving Christ? Are we going after the ways of the world? Are we becoming more conformed to the image of Christ? That's something that elders have on their mind all the time. You know what? Quite often when... Um, you guys might be binge-watching something on Netflix. Elder of the church that is serving well is not going to have time to do that. We're not going to have time to spend all this time on, with, with certain hobbies. But the more time we spend with certain hobbies, the more we are going to be lacking in serving in the, in the church. And then he continues on. He says, um, yeah, if there's anything that's lacking, a point um, and appointing elders in every church, as I commanded you, he goes on to give the, give the qualifications of an elder. You know, there's actually some pretty stringent qualifications of an elder. It says, if a man is blameless, that means that um, you talk to his friends, you talk to his, his, his neighbors, you talk to the unbelievers, you talk to people that, don't even, that aren't even part of the church, he's got to have a good report, especially those outside the church. Right? He's got to be blameless. He can't be someone that you say, oh yeah, you know what, he's a He's, he's crooked in business. He's shady in business. I don't like the way he treats his kids. I don't like the way he treats his wife. No, but he's got to be blameless. The husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of um, dissipation or insubordination. So he's got to be able to rule his house well. For a bishop must be blameless this, um, as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money. So these are the things that if there's someone that's a leader of the church, somebody from the outside that sees somebody that is self-willed or quick-tempered, somebody that just flies off a handle or a drunkard, someone that is known to be a brawler, well, people are going to say, well, I don't want nothing to do with that. Like, I thought the church was supposed to be better. I said, is that like, they're going to turn people away from Christ rather than people leading people to Christ. So as, as a leader of the church, these are some of the qualifications. That you can't be those things. But instead, in verse 8 there, he says, but hospitable, a lover of what is good. So to be an elder in the church, to be a bishop in the church, you need to be hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded. You know, think, think about things clearly. You've got to be just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast um, to the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and convince those who contradict. So uh, you have to be able to 
hold to sound doctrine and be able to exhort and convince people that are naysayers, convince people that are going against the doctrine of the, of the scriptures. He says, for there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. There's going to be a lot of people. And, and when, he t when he's talking about for those of, of the circumcision, in today's age, for us, it's not talking about we have to worry about the Jews. We do. We do have to worry about people, but it's also people that are religious, right? It's worry about the people that are going to tell you that, no, you need to become more and more religious and start keeping the laws in order to become right with God. That's not the gospel. Okay, the gospel is not that you need to start doing all these things and then God is going to accept you. The gospel is that Jesus died for your sins. And the outflowing of that is going to be your life is going to be conformed to the image of Christ. So elders, as an elder of the church, we have a great um, responsibility, a great responsibility to, to, to the fold. And when the chief shepherd appears, we're going to be judged according to our service. We're going to be judged according to how we behaved, how we acted. Now in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse, in verse 5, now, he's, now he turns and addresses the younger people. He addresses those that are to be submission under the elders. He says, likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to the elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another. So he's saying, young people, submit to your elders, but all of you, everybody, submit to one another. Because you know, there's going to be times where an elder may need to submit to a younger person if he's in the wrong. Like, that's not, he's not saying that that's not going to be the case at times. But he's saying that younger people, be submissive. Submit yourselves to the elders. And be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Now, this respect for older people in general is something that is lacking in our culture. Like, I remember when I was just, just a young kid, when I, when I was, I don't know, I might have been 10 or 11 years old, and I remember my teacher saying that, you know what, kids used to have respect for, the, for, their, for, their, for older people. They used to have respect for teachers. And this was 20, 27 years ago, 28 years ago. This was like when I was young. And I look at right now, I'm thinking, like, man, I remember when kids used to have respect. And my, like they, older people thought my generation was disrespectful. And you know what? Like, there is, in our culture, there is less and less respect continually. Now, from where we come from, the Mennonite culture, we actually have a different term when you want to talk to somebody that in, in a, in a um, re, respectful way. So you children that don't know German, um, when you're talking, when, when, when we're talking to our, to our parents or to anybody that's older than us, we call them ye. We don't call them du, because du is you. Ye is a respectful way of saying you, right? It, it's kind of like having, it's, it's kind of like pluralizing the word, right? It's, we, we would say um, ye, it'd be kind of like you all, but it's not, we're only talking to one person. So it's like, it's like you use a plural form and now I remember quite often where I would call somebody ye, like an older person, I was like 20 or 20 years or more older than me, and then saying like, oh, no, 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 don't, don't call me that. Like, I don't want to be old. Like, so I remember people saying like, they don't want that term of respect. Now I remember my uncle, told, my, actually my father and I telling me one instance where um, he called somebody Drew, and that person was like, don't you think you ought to be calling me ye? And he's like, okay, how old are you, by the way? And it turned out that my father and I was actually 10 years older than him. <laughs> so it was the other way around. So, so some people demand respect when they don't reserve it. They don't deserve it. But all too often, I think our culture even doesn't want respect. Older people don't want to be respected by the younger people. And I think maybe that's partly why a lot of young people, they don't respect older people in the way that we should. The Bible actually teaches us that we ought to respect our elders, right? Respect the people that are older than you. In Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 32, it says, You shall rise, you shall rise before the gray-headed and honor the presence of an old man. And fear your God, I am the Lord. So here God tells us, you, know, you, you should actually be respectful to people that have gray hair. To people that are older than you, like that, that should be, the gold, gray hair should be a badge of honor. It's not something that you want to try to get rid of your gray hair. No, but gray hair is a badge of honor. I, man, I wish I could go go gray. 
Like, I always look at Frank, and he's, he's my age. He's got gray hair. I'm like, man, I'm, I'm going to lose my hair before it goes gray. <laughs> I want gray hair. I think I'm getting a little bit of gray in my beard. But So, yes, gray hair is, is, is a badge of honor. We shouldn't look at that as something to, to try to look younger. No, you know what? Getting older, man, this means we're getting closer to Jesus. <laughs> So yes, and, and they, he does say there in, that, yes, you all be submissive to one another. So he's not saying that, yeah, because you're older now, people should just respect you and you should do whatever you want. No, he says be submissive to one another. So we have to also give room to know that, you know, there's going to come times where a younger person may respectfully um, um, have something to say against somebody that's older. You know, in a respectful way, we are, we are meant to be submissive to one another as well. <clears throat> now, just last week, um, yeah, last week I was at I was I was at home with our with our foster boys, while Liz was here, and it just so happened that we had this exact I had a little discussion with him about respects because you know, he's five years old, the oldest boy here, he's five years old, but I'll tell you what, five year olds know everything. If you think a teenager knows everything, five year olds know more than a teenager. I'll tell you what. I, I remember one time Lucas had to tell me that I didn't know something when his teacher said something, and it turned out that. He just misunderstood his teacher, but no, he said for sure he knew what he was talking about. Well, anyways, last week, um, we, were sitting, like, we were sitting in my shop listening to the message that Tony was preaching, um, and I was trying to teach the boys, you know, hey, if you guys want to come to church, like, they weren't feeling very well, so I, I had them at home, so I, I had, had the baby on my lap, and I was teaching them, you know, I got to teach them how to sit nice in church and telling the boys how to, you know, if you guys want to sit in church, you guys got to sit nice and be nice and quiet, and they're like, can I have a snack? No, no, we, church's not done yet. We got, we're going to sit here nice and quiet. Well, it came, we were getting close to the end of the message, and they're getting a little more restless, and then somehow, the oldest boy, he talks about, or no, somehow it came up, you know, we got to listen to Tony preach. He's like, his name is not Tony, his name is Tiny. I'm like, what? No, he's not. So he's like, no, his name is Tiny Fair. It's like, no, his, na- his name is Tony Fair. Like, it's like, no, it's Tiny Fair. So I'm just like, okay. It, it, no, his name is... Tony Fair. No, it's Tiny Fair. So I was like, okay, listen, I went to the YouTube thing. I said, look, see right here? Here's the name of the message by Tony Fair. <coughs> like, no, that's wrong. I was like, so you're saying the internet's wrong. Like, the internet, this is all on the internet for everybody to see. You're saying, it's, yeah, it's wrong. His name is Tiny. So I was like, I was a little bit taken back. I'm trying to be gracious. I'm trying to, you know, it's like, okay. Um, you know what? I know Tony since he was a baby. I, told him, I, I knew him since he was a baby. I remember when he was born, I, went, I hung out with his brother. So I know, I've known Tony for a very long time, and his name is Tony Fair. Like, no, it's not. So I'm just like, like, he keeps going on. I was like, okay, you know what? He's Abe's best friend. Abe introduces everybody at the beginning. So I was like, I, went, I found the spot in the beginning where Abe introduced him. I said, look, right here. And it says, so Abe says, yeah, and we're going to have Tony Fair doing that. He says, Tiny Fair. He's like, no, we didn't. So I, but we went listening to like three or four times. And then finally, I could see it in his eyes. Like, he knew he was wrong. So I asked him, so what's his name? Tiny Fair. Now he was just gonna, he was not gonna back down. He, he knew, that's his, that his name. So then I was like, all right. So I told, Vincent was with me watching the kids. I told him, you take the other two boys inside. They wanted a snack, we'll take him a snack. I got a little, I got a word with this boy here. <laughs> got a little talk with him and just, so I, I told him like, hey, you know what? Okay, I've, I've told you now that, I, I've told you on the internet what his name is. I've told you that I've known him since he was a baby. I, I know his name is Tony Fair. And Abe Dyke says his name is Tony Fair. So what's his name? And he didn't want to answer. Like, well, what's his name? I'm telling you, I'm trying to teach you something here, and you're not, but you're not a teacher. So again, with that attitude, it's like, what do you mean I'm not a teacher? Yes, I'm a teacher. No, you're not a teacher. I was like, okay, I'll tell you what. I am a teacher. Here's why I'm a teacher. Like I told him, like, okay, our, our kids, where do they go to school? They homeschool. It's like, yes, yeah, so who teaches them? Liz teaches them, and I teach them. I'm a teacher to them in school. And you want, not only that, they go to a homeschool group, and at their homeschool group, I've taught at their homeschool group. And you know what? When I preach, I'm up here and I'm teaching people. I'm a teacher, okay? So I'm trying to teach you something, but if you don't let me teach you something, you're never going to learn. So then he's, I can see that. His wheel's starting to turn there. It's like, okay. I kind of, starting to get through to him. And I was like, okay, you know what? And by the way, if I'm trying to teach you something and you're not willing to learn, you're never going to learn anything. So I told him, you know what? Your teacher, there's a lot of things that your teacher knows that I don't know. But you know what? There's a lot of things that I know that your teacher does not know. So we had our garage door, we had the shop door open. I said, look at the house over there. See the house? Who built that house? You did? 
It's like, that's right I did. You know how I know how to build a house? Because I know how to build a house. And guess what? I can teach people how to build a house. Your teacher, does she know how to build a house? No, no, she does not. She does not know how to build a house. But you know what? There's a lot of things your teacher knows, and I hope that she teaches you. So I told him that he's an extremely smart boy. He's super intelligent. I said, you know what? You're very smart. You know way more than I did when I was five years old. But there's a lot of things that you don't know. And then I had to explain to him that, you know how, well, yeah, before that, I asked him, like, how old are you? And he said, well, he's five. Well, I asked him, how old am I? You know what? I've spent, I'm 38 years old, so I've, you've spent five years learning stuff. I've spent 38 years learning stuff. How much do you think I know in 38 years? So finally, I had to go through this whole process. You know what? Because I am older than him, I've had some experience, and I'm hoping that he learns everything that I learned by the time I'm that, old, that age. And all of a sudden, by the end of it, I think I finally got through to him. I asked him, so what was, what's the boy, that, the man that was preaching, what was his name? He's like, Tony Fair. It's like, that's right. Now you're willing to learn something. You just learned something. Very good. I taught you something. That's great. Now let's go inside and have a snack. <laughs> so, I, and I think that's kind of our culture. Like, I think like, this is an extreme case where, but I think our culture kind of has that mindset that, you know what? I know better. I can't be taught by anybody else. I don't want to be taught by somebody else because if they teach me something that I don't know, they're just wrong. I think a lot of our culture has that mindset. We don't have that respect for older people. So I think just um, having that experience with them last week and then preparing for this message, I'm just like, yeah, I think like, respect is really lacking. I, I think it is. There's a lot of, there, there's not that respect for people that are older in our general, in our culture today. I got a verse for you. I got a passage for you that's actually quite interesting. You guys might like this one. It's Proverbs chapter 6, starting at verse 16. Um, so Proverbs chapter 6, starting at verse 16, it says, These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. Hold on a sec. Here's six things. Like, okay, so the law, God has the law. But he says, you know, these are the things that we should do. You know, don't, don't commit murder. Don't commit sexual adultery. Don't, like, there's all these things. But now he says, six things that the Lord hates. Yes, yeah, seven of them are an abomination to him. And guess what's first on the list? A proud look. A proud look is the first thing on the list. You know, that, that pride, that I know better. Look at me. I, I'm not going to listen to anybody else. But no, he says a proud look. So first on the list, a proud look. Then a lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked plans. Feet that are swift to run to evil. A false a false witness who speaks lies and one who sows discord among brethren. So here, there's, there's a lot of very, um, very sinful attitudes in there. And the first one of that is a proud look. A proud look. <clears throat> so when he says that God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble, well, there's a reason why God resists the proud because that's on the list of the seven things that he hates that are an abomination to him. The first thing on the list that he mentioned is, you know, a proud look. God despises the, pri- the proud. <clears throat> In Luke chapter 14, verse 11, it says, For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. In James chapter 4, verse 10, it says, Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. You know that if, if we're lifted up by God... It's not an action of humility, but it's an action where people recognize that there is God's grace upon you. But when you are proud and you lift yourself up, you're going to be tore down. You're going to be humbled. The time is going to come when you're going to be humbled. So moving on to verse 7. He says, "Cast Cast your cares upon him, for he cares for you. He's saying, like, in our life, we need to cast all of our cares upon Jesus. Cast all of our cares upon God because God cares for us. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, it says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Do you guys recognize that God cares for you? When, when you're anxious about something, when you have something that's like, you know, that's just, I'm just not sure where to go with this. Do you recognize that God cares about that? God cares for you. He says, don't be anxious for that. Don't, don't let that control your life and don't get a lack of sleep because of that. But no, cast your care upon him by prayer and supplication. 
Let your, let your request be made known to God. And you know what? When you do that, you know what's going to happen? If, if you can't sleep because there's just so much turmoil, so much anxiety there, if you can't sleep, when you cast your cares upon God, you know what happens? The peace of God guards your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, you won't be able to explain it. It's just like, I couldn't sleep, I prayed, and I slept like a rock. Because you know that God cares for you, so you cast your cares upon him. In Psalms verse 34, verse, uh, Psalms 34, verse 15, it says, The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. You know, God is listening to you. He wants you to come to him because he cares for you. You know, we have an abundance of reasons to cast our cares upon Jesus. First of all, because we don't know what tomorrow holds. So we're going to be anxious for things that we don't even need to be anxious for. Have you ever noticed that you're only ever anxious about the past and the future? When are you ever anxious about the present? The present is just there. You're living it, so you're not anxious about it. But you're anxious about what are we going to do later on? What are we going to do tomorrow? What's, what's the outcome of this going to be? Cast your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Don't be anxious about tomorrow. Tomorrow is suffi- the f- sufficient as a trouble for, for, for tomorrow. And Jesus, when, when, he's, uh, when he's preaching on the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 25, he says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? But look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet their heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? (laughs) Which of you, by worrying, can add a cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I say to you that even Solomon in his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothed the the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows what you have need of. Or for your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient is the day of its own trouble." Those are the words of Jesus. We should take that to heart and just remember, cast your cares upon him because he cares for us. Be anxious for nothing, but in all things by prayer and supplication, let your request be made known to God. So in verse 8 there of 1 Peter chapter 5, he says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by their brotherhood in the world. So what do we do? We we, we rest upon God, but we also, we need to be sober. We need to think soberly about what are we doing here? Like, what, like what kind of what kind of things do I approve of? What kind of movies do I watch? What kind of music do I listen to? How am I conducting my life? What kind of clothes do I wear? Like, all these things, we need to be sober, be vigilant. Because we have to recognize that this world, like we're not just in this world just kind of going by and whatever it happens, happens. It's like whatever decisions you make doesn't really have, an, have any kind of effect. But know that in every, at every turn, our adversary, the devil, is there like a roaring light. And he's seeking to devour. He's seeking to destroy your faith. But no, that's why Peter says in chapter 1, it says, Therefore, gird up your loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your, fully, rest your hope fully upon the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
but no, we need to be in, or we need to be watchful in our prayers. Is what Peter says in chapter four, verse seven. But no, we need to be watchful in our prayer. We need to think things seriously. We know that the end of all things is at hand. We can't just be going through this life just acting as though things don't matter. It doesn't matter what I do, what I wear. It doesn't matter the, the music I listen to. It doesn't really affect my mind. It's like, yeah, right, it doesn't. The music you affect your mind, the, the music you listen to affects your mind. The, the TV shows you watch affect your mind. The friends you hang out with they, they, they affect your attitude. They affect your behavior. They affect your way of life, your, your way that you see things. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses, starting at verse 10, he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Listen, how do we, how do we combat our adversary, the devil? Well, we put on the whole armor of God, right? That we can, be un- that we can stand against the, dar- the darts of the devil. And he says, For we do not wrestle against the flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. You know, we, have, we are in the midst of a spiritual battle, and I think far too often we're just sitting on the sidelines. The battle is happening. The battle is raging. Okay, you know what? The battle is going to happen whether you're in it or not. But the more people, the more Christians are just sitting on the sidelines, the more we're allowing the world to be corrupted by the evil one. If we think that our life doesn't matter, the things we do, the things we watch, the, people, the friends we listen to, those kinds of things don't matter, is the, is, is the word of God paramount in your life? Is the words of the scripture, is that the one thing that you hold to more dearly than anything else? Or is it whichever artist you happen to like at that moment? Like, yeah, I love the songs of, I'm not sure, you pick your artist. That's the one, I know all the lyrics, but I don't know any Bible verses. It's like, what, what rules your life? The principalities, the powers of the air, the, kept, the, 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 the general conception, the general ideology of the, of, the, of the culture is ruled by the evil one. It's, it's not ruled by the Bible. But no, we combat that by putting on the whole armor of God. So starting at verse 13 in Ephesians chapter 6, he, he, he goes through the armor of God. Well, what is it? Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand um, on the evil day, having all to stand, to stand. Therefore, having girded your waist with the belt of truth, yeah, put on the breastplate of righteousness. We have the belt of truth. We have the breastplate of righteousness. Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, Above all, take the shield of faith with which you may be able to quench the fiery darts of the evil one, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplications in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all um, perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So we need to be rooted and grounded in the truth of the gospel. And we do that with the whole armor of God. In James chapter 4, verse 7, it says, Therefore submit to God and resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You know, if, if, if the devil feels any kind of resistance, he will flee from you. But how often do we take up the armor of God to resist the devil? That should be our first, that, that, that should be our first thought. When, when we feel the temptation of the devil, we resist him with the armor of God. We resist him with the word of the Spirit, with the sword of the Spirit. Knowing that everything that we've been tempted with is the same temptations as is experienced by, common man, by, by every man. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse, 30, verse 13 tells us that, that no temptation is overtaking you except which is common to men. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with temptation, will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So when you're tempted in any way, we need to hold fast to that scripture, knowing that you know God has made a way of escape for every temptation that, has, that, that, that comes in our way. And knowing that every temptation that comes our way is the same temptation that comes in everybody's way. 
it's the same temptation as is common to all men. I was trying, I know we have communion today, so I was trying not to go too long today, but it's just when there's uh, so much scripture to back, to, to kind of, to go through, there it's, uh, yeah, it'll take a while, but I'm just going to try moving forward here. The rest of it, I, it's just, he's got his, uh, got his final closing prayers, or his closing remarks here, um, but yeah, in verse Verse 10, he says, But may the God of all peace, who called us into his, glo- in, into his eternal glory by Jesus Christ, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and dominion forever. Amen. So you know what? The, in his letter here, he tells us that, you know what, we're going to have sufferings. You know, as a Christian, you're going to have sufferings. But every suffering you go through has a purpose. And that purpose is to refine our faith, to make our faith like precious gold. In chapter 1, verse 7, he says that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So when Jesus comes back, he's going to look back at your life and your faith is going to be refined through the, through the, um, through the struggles of this life, through the sufferings of this life, so that those sufferings may perfect us, that they may establish us in the truth of God's word, that they may strengthen us, that when the next time those temptations come, the next time those trials come, that we're strengthened, we can overcome them more gracefully. We can fully lean. We don't sometimes try to toil and try to figure our own way through it, but immediately we lean upon the grace of God. And at the end of our life, we are fully settled where the devil doesn't even try to tempt us anymore because he knows it's hopeless. Because we're fully established in the truth of the gospel, fully leaning upon the grace of God. He says, By Silvanus, our faithful brother, as I consider him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. She who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you, as is Mark, my son. Greet one another with the kiss of love. Peace to you, um, Peace to you all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. So he closes here just with his final statement saying that Salvanus, the same, and I I believe it's the same one that um, um, Paul, the same Salvanus that Paul oftentimes wrote his letters to, or had his letters delivered by as well. He's saying that that's who's going to bring him the letter. So this letter was written to exhort us and to encourage us to walk in the truth, to, to let us know that, you know what, we are, we are going to be facing trials and temptations. But to stand strong in those t- trials and temptations. And to just to remind us that no matter what we're going through in this world, just to keep our, keep our eye on the prize. Keep our eyes on the prize. Remember that the end of our, the end of our suffering is, will be at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So I think I'm just going to leave it there for this morning. I'm going to open it up for sharing if anybody has any, um, any comments, any, any thoughts, any questions. Or... Yeah, if nobody has any questions, I think what we'll do is we'll, um, <clears throat> um, we'll have the singing for communion. So we'll have our, we have our communion and... Um, Usually what we do is, like, if, if there's any visitors here, we, we welcome you. If, if, if um, 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 you're, a, you're a born-again believer, we welcome you to come and take part in communion with us. Communion is, is not just for the Church of Springfield, but when you have communion, it's for all believers. So if there's a believer that is here, if, if, if you're relying upon the grace of Jesus, if you're trusting in the blood of Jesus for your salvation, that's what communion is for, knowing that Jesus suffered for our sins. When we drink the, when we drink the wine, we recognize that Jesus poured out his, want, his blood on our behalf. That, that should have been us that took that penalty that he took on the cross. And that when we took that, take that bread, that, that we, we are reminded of his body that was broken for us. So yeah, that's why we take, we take part in communion. And um, so yeah, we'll, we'll, have, um, <clears throat> we'll, have, we'll have Dave just, just sing, and as he sings, we'll take part in communion. And then after 
after the singing is done, then um, we're just going to have a dedication prayer for us to go to Uganda, just so that because we want that trip to be for the glory and honor of God. We want to have we want to um, go and serve Him. So we just want to dedicate that time to Him in prayer as well. But let's maybe um, before we start singing, let's just uh, bow, our, bow our heads for a word of prayer. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for for the gathering of the saints. We thank you, Father, for everyone here this morning. We thank you, Father, for the cup of communion. Thank you that that your body was broken on our behalf, that you took that punishment that, that we deserved, that you became sin. Even though you had never sinned, you became the sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. We could become the righteousness of Christ. We thank you, Father, for the free gift of salvation. And as we take part in communion, may we just recognize that you are our God, that you loved us, you loved us so much that you came to bear the penalty of sin. That you loved the world so much that you came to, to redeem us to yourself. And you've also given us that, that hope, that promise of an eternal home. You've told us that you've, you've gone to prepare a place for us. And Father, we are fully resting on that hope. We ask, Father, that your, we ask, Father, for your blessing upon this morning. We ask for your blessing as we leave here this evening, this morning as well. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.